Welcome to the Celtic Way Sit Down with me, Tony Haggerty, at the Haggerty 10 on the Twitter handle. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by this guy. Because if you know our history, and if you know your history, you know myself and <laughs> Russell Boyce, as he Boyce, as he's known, used to uh, we used to form part of the Monday Club on a Celtic yes. state of mind. And so today's a bit special for myself and Russell because we haven't been on a broadcast since those days and it's a bit of a reunification and Russell's going to talk me through the five Celtic moments that made me, or the five Celtic moments that made him. He's the latest in our guests. If you hopefully you've enjoyed the show so far, I kicked it off myself. Paul Lambert did it, Kev McKenna did it and Ryan 118 did it as well. And uh, yeah, so we'll uh, endeavour to, in reverse order, Boise's 5, 4, yes. three, 2, 1. And as everybody knows, I used to call him the resident rascal. So <laughs> you will, this will be a treat, ladies and gentlemen. But I urge you first and foremost to look at the strap line running along the bottom of your screen. And you can help us support top quality journalism covering the club you love by subscribing to the Celtic Way website. And uh, it's there at the bottom. If you log on to www.celticway.co.uk forward slash subscribe, and uh, you can do that. If you enjoy the videos, like, subscribe, tell all your friends to do the same. But Boise, how are you? And I kind of, what was it? Kieran Tierney, near Beaton style Sapnin Boise. <laughs> I'm all good, mate. Joy to be back on with you, Tony. I love yes. those days doing the Monday the Monday shows. And aye, cheers for asking us. And obviously, we've, we've kept in relatively close contact over the past couple yeah. of years anyway. So us talking football and reminiscing about past <laughs> glory days at Celtic will be nothing new to us, mate. I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll survive this test, mate. <laughs> and yes, and uh, if you want to catch up with Russell regularly, you can tune into the Boise Bus, Russell forms his own podcast and doing rather well, is it not, Russell? I, I it does surprisingly well, mate. I don't know, I don't know where they all come <laughs> from, but I, I mean, I called it the Boise Bus. I like to get this clear. Like at the start, just so folk knew I'd set up on my own. I now cringe whenever I hear that Boise <laughs> Bus. I wish, I wish it was just called the Bus. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in, you're in up to your neck in it now. Hey, Russell, yes. that's one of the ones, isn't it? But uh, yeah, I mean, and as, as I say, it is quite special because we, I think the last time we were actually together in each other's company would be Scotland, England. Yes, Euros, that's right, yes, yeah. Uh, mm. yeah. So indeed, it's it's been a while, but it's been a while since we shared a, a platform like this and we were talking all things Celtic. And yeah, in, in the season that shall not be named, mm. uh, boy, say, yeah, and bad news was the order of the day, yeah. And, <laughs> Every Monday we would have to negotiate that, but we got through it and enjoyed it. We did, mate. Yes, indeed. We now, did. let's kick off. We'll go straight okay. to it, Boise, and we'll take your number five in your Celtic moments and uh, declaration here. I don't know any of these, so this is coming to me uh, as live as it can be. No, <laughs> no, no preparation. No, yeah, exactly. So uh, take it away, Mr. Boyce. I think before I get into the five, it would be remiss of me not to say, I think Seville's probably the peak, but I've not included it in the five, just so you've got a bit of variation of moments. But I think Seville's the sort of Everest we nearly climbed. And I think, it, like, in my lifetime, I mean, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And I think, like, it would be, uh, be silly of me to, like, everyone would put that in, really, of my generation. So I did want to leave that one out, but not also give it the wee sort of doff of the cap that it deserves, right? But uh, number five for me... Funnily enough, uh, Tony, a bit like me and you doing broadcast together, we just can't get enough. Uh, mm. He brought back the thunder, and it was Celtic 3 Rangers nil. if you remember that game. Neil Lennon's first full season in charge, a new wave of players, and I felt like, guys, you could really relate to. I think that that season where Lenny had, there was a last of a generation that you could sign young that would still respond to that sort of... Uh, you know, people want to call it dinosaur coach, and I call it just as a different style. But that sort of man management, sort of, you know, pushing you to greater heights through using tricks of the mind, a wee bit of aggression, a wee bit of fight, a wee bit of dig, all that sort of stuff. 
and we played some exhilarating football. He promised the Thunder that year. And um, Lennon was in his first, that was his first season as a manager. Celtic, think of what it means to him first and foremost. Then think of how difficult it is to go up against Walter Smith and a Rangers side that had won, what was it, two titles in a row by that point. Lenny had built a side I felt was really, really exciting. I thought there was heroes sort of growing all over that team or potentially could have been had to remain longer. Um, but yeah, I thought that 3 0 game when I just can't get enough sort of really became like an anthem in the stands, if you remember. It was just completely rocking. Yeah. And that for me was a, a, a brilliant day. And it just, I think in my personal life as well, not to ramble too much, but I was just, in a, I was on fire at that point. You know what I mean? I was young, on own pub and stuff, and it was just a great time. And I was ages at that point with a lot of the Celtic signings. You know what I mean? Like I was in and around yeah. Joe Ledley, Kyle's age, and it just felt like I—I I don't know. I identified with them, and I thought that three 0 game was an absolute masterclass. Three 0 being the was that Gary Hooper twice and yes. Chris Commons, yeah. Yes. Gary Hooper, uh, yeah. The, the second the goal in that yeah. game was <laughs> the second goal in that game was an absolute beauty, wasn't it? The yeah. ball into Izagiri and the cross across goal, and Gary Hooper sliding in and. I think there was a moment in that game where it cut to Neil Lennon after that goal and he was jumping about mental because it's a kind of goal he loves, getting the ball down the flank and whipped across and mm-hmm. impossible to defend when it's when it's done right. And uh, Izagiri and... I can't remember who played the ball, Izagiri. Uh, Samaras. For, for, Samaras, yeah, for the life of me. Right, cool. Thank you for that. And uh, a, a brilliant goal. I mean, there was three cracking goals that day. You said Celtic mm-hmm. uh, went to town on Rangers that day, but that second goal was basically the clinching goal because you knew Rangers were never coming back yep. from that. As you say, everybody was singing, just can't get enough. Place was rocking. He did bring the thunder back that day. And you saw a team in a kind of ascendancy with the players that Lennon had assembled day, eh? Likes yep. of Hooper coming to the fore, Samaras, guys like that. Yep. Uh, Commons. You know, and I, yeah, I think in terms of games against Rangers, that would be up there for a lot of people's uh, memories as well because it was everybody remembers it, don't they? they, yeah, they it's just, emphatic. It was yeah, emphatic when it was, it was a three 0 going on. Yeah, it was three 0 going on. Whatever you like, because of the domination that we'd sort of shown in that game. And as you say about that goal as well, I mean, he's a giddy at that point in his debut season. We could not believe how good he was in that yeah. first season, and he's four hundred and fifty thousand pounds. You know what I mean? And no one expects them to be as good as he was. And that overlap and run. The vision for Sammy and Hooper as well. I mean, someone who really was, you know, the jersey was beginning to fit him pretty quick, I thought, at Celtic as well. A bona fide goal scorer um, and two great finishes that day. And as I say, I mean, yeah, I, Chris Commons, that's right. He'd, he'd not long joined. He was making that, he was scoring almost every single game as well. But yeah. as I say, I just think it was an exciting, vibrant team. And that performance, I felt, in Lennon's first season was the sort of benchmark, if you like, and probably the as close to the end product that he was trying to achieve for the yeah. team that year happened in that 90 minutes. Yeah, I've got to agree. I, I think uh, lots of people, it's a, it's a game that you remember fondly, isn't it, for all, all of the above and everything that you've mentioned, but certainly for Lenny, he, he enjoyed it, didn't he? Because as you say, oh, that yeah. that was a major scalp, you know, kind of bossing Walter Smith that day when he's just... It, it was, as you say, them fat, as emphatic as it gets in terms of, of a scoreline. But yeah, and, and Commons goal putting the kind of seal on it, wasn't it? The kind of long range strike where McGregor seemed to completely misjudge it, didn't he? And mis- definitely, mid- very, very rare that McGregor would do something like that. But he seemed to dive the other way, didn't he? And then kind of change my dear. But no. <laughs> it was as is all as is always the way. Also, like seeing the see that first half display. And when you go 2-0 up, and as you say, you kind of knew they're not getting back in this now. But yeah. as is always the way I find, it, it's weird, but the second half never seems to sort of play out the same with that same sort of... And I mean, don't get me wrong, Celtic at no point were in danger for me on that afternoon at all. But I, do, I wonder what happens. I think it would have been a, a sin had Commons not got that third goal, just to sort of rubber stamp with a bit of... Um, yeah, with a result, a statement result as well as the performance, because 
two 0 doesn't quite give the gloss that, that that display deserved. So I was really chuffed that they got that that third goal in the second half because I think that was the sort of icing on the cake, and it was it was good to get that. Yeah, and as you said, Lenny promised to Lenny promised to bring the thunder back. That was that was a thunderdome that day, wasn't it? Probably. I mean, probably. But I watched it in. in a, I know I said old moan pub, but I went to Glasgow to watch it. Watched it in the West End. I'm trying to remember the name of the bar. I can't remember. But me, uh, my pal, and his cousins went out to watch it. Uh, Big Manny and like me and his family were in the back of a black cab, and that was all that was in our head after it. You know, just saying, do, 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 do. and the taxi was rocking. Turns out the uh, the driver was a Celtic fan as well. He's loving it, loving like just killing himself <laughs> after this black cab. It was traffic, it was packed, and this black cab was just rocking away. But I always remember that day going, Where's that song came from? And why has <laughs> it not been there for years before? It was great, brilliant. Yeah, excellent. Good first choice. Can only get better. Yes. Number four, Russell. Number four. Yes. So um, this one is interesting because it's topical. And uh, ah. I wonder, I wonder if his return second time round will be in the top five moments in ten years. If I'm ever asked these questions <laughs> again, but I think uh, Brendan, not just his arrival, but I'm going to say the the, the first Glasgow derby, the five one. Um, reasons being, Celtic for me were in a bit of a rut. Now, there's many factors behind that. I think the team had lost identity. Who was in charge of making the signings? I think the light where that Ronnie Dyle has seen something in the likes of KT, Callum McGregor, that hadn't been seen prior to that. Um, and they were getting sort of opportunity. Out with that, I mean, I think when you're seeing Colin Kazim Richards up front and guys like Carlton Cole and stuff, like getting fan chants and stuff like that, where like nowhere near a Celtic first team, a Celtic, a proper on form Celtic first team should be. Um, I looked at that and I just felt we'd lost our way a wee bit. Uh, I don't know. Many will speculate whether it's because there wasn't Rangers in the league. That's why the top tier was shut. I think a lot of fans had just sort of lost sort of what direction of travel the club was taking. But boy, oh boy, did we turn it round. I mean, I think everyone, it was a sort of pinch me moment when you heard maybe like the day before Brendan Rodgers is now favourite to get the, the Celtic job or the couple of days before, whatever it was. And it seemed just like pulled out of nowhere. And you're thinking from the penalty shootout loss in the Scottish Cup semi-final to Brendan Rodgers is in charge. When do we next play them? September. I can't remember the date. But early September, they're going for 55. We were going for 5-1. That's what happened. It was no problem. It was a, a sensational display. And to be honest with you, I felt it was a display of Rodgers like, I think there was hype at the time and there was a belief, not just from Rangers fraternity, but from impartial characters in the media that these signings that Rangers had made, i.e. Joey Bartons, Philip Senderosis of the world, were a real challenge. And the guys they already had there already had enough for Celtic, obviously, to see them uh, see them out of the Scottish Cup semi-final. Our narrative was building. This was going to be close. What a way to sort of <laughs> announce your arrival in this fixture. Um, not just Brendan Musa Dembele's hat trick, a perfect hat trick, which goes on miss sometimes, a right, a left, and, and a header. I mean, it was an unbelievable afternoon that, and we really kicked on from there. Um, and also, as I say, I just think when you contrast and compare the last time we'd faced Rangers to that, it was a sea change of whatever that saying is. But it was a massive turnaround anyway <laughs> in a very short space of time. Yeah, I I agree. I think everybody who was at that Hamden semi-final, Scottish Cup semi-final defeat, was crestfallen. But the one man who kept his shape on all of it was the mustachioed one. Might have bristled a wee bit at that, but he decided no more and took the club in a direction. And I think ever since... That decision has been made. The club hasn't really looked back at all. Yeah, uh, I hear you on that. You know, yeah, uh, and people can argue to toss about Neil Lennon and stuff like that. There were a lot of mitigating circumstances for blowing the 10. But from the moment that you heard that Brendan Rodgers uh, was coming in the first time, I think Celtic, to all intents and purposes, have acted like a big club. 
they're acting like a bigger club now, uh, to be fair. But I, I agree with you. There was there was just something different about that uh, that managerial appointment, wasn't there? To anything that you'd maybe witnessed in your your own lifetime of supporting Celtic, you know, when yep. what was it, thirteen to fifteen thousand turned up to watch a man swirl a scarf about, and they were singing, they were singing hymns, adorning them and praising them, stuff like that, and you know, you just it, it caught a moment in time, and I think that it was reminiscent to to Martin O'Neill's statement, man, wasn't it, six two. Except O'Neill was up against a very good Rangers team, and uh, and labelled Rangers the benchmark back then. But Brendan Rodgers made a statement of intent with that victory, and said, "We're a much better team than you guys. If you think you're going for fifty-five, take a bit of that." And uh, and they never recovered from that. I mean, Joey Barton said he was going to come up and be the best player. Left not long after. A masterclass from Scott Brown in midfield, as you say, Musa Dembele's perfect hat trick, Scott Sinclair's goal, Scott Sinclair who had a wonderful first season at Celtic, guys like Stuart Armstrong who Brendan Rodgers made better, and you're kind of seeing history repeat itself with the likes of David Turnbull at this minute, uh, guys like that, uh, Alexandro Bernabe, hopefully Matt O'Reilly as well. We can make better, you know, he's, that's he's forty, but. I agree that that five one game was uh, yeah again you, when you look back on these things it, you smile don't you they, they give you kind of a warm glow in your heart games like absolutely. that absolutely you know and you 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 shake your head and you go yeah I remember that and and I think everybody every Celtic supporter just loved Musa Dembele didn't they who doesn't love a goal scorer but who doesn't love a goal scorer who turned up in the matches that mattered and Musa yeah. Dembele with an, an uncanny knack and habit of turning up and the matches that matter because remember he didn't start as the main striker Lee Griffiths started as the main striker that season didn't he? I and think then... Dembele had started one game before that but he played sort of out wide yeah. I don't think it was the most compelling display if I remember right I am sure the sort of lead up that week was with no Griffiths, what's this Dembele sort of going to be like now? Yes. You don't like to read between the, you know, you read a wee bit further back data and go, this guy was subject of a six million bid when he had five months left in his deal at Fulham from <laughs> Tottenham Hotspur. He was on Chelsea's list of targets at one point. This guy was coming with 20 goals the season before in the championship. He was a yeah. prospect and a half and more than capable. But of I course, on Dembele, like what? I actually think that was the the after match interview when Sky Sports Luke Shanley uh, said to Brendan Rodgers, "Lee who is a kind of joke," and Brendan Rodgers said those words, "Don't be disrespectful." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure it was that, wasn't it? Because yeah. they had a right good start to the the season, and and Brendan in and and I've got a lot of time for Luke. He's a cracking guy. Yeah, he's a a journalistic colleague and. I think it was one of those uh, attempts at humour that you know just went well wide of the target because he di he didn't mean it disparagingly. He was trying to make a wee kind of quip as if you know Lee's had a great start to the season, but where where's this guy been hiding type thing, you know? And but Brendan just kind of took it the wrong way and you no know, don't be disrespectful and he kind of pointed and he sort of Luke Shanley was on the the back foot at that point, but. I, I remember that vividly, and uh, yeah, and obviously it was a case of wow, Dembele's just hit the ground running, and first player I think since Harry Hood to score a hat trick against Rangers. Harry Hood did it in a cup tie, but he was the first player to score a hat trick since Stevie Chalmers managed it in a in a league game against Rangers. Wow, like sixty six. When Celtic won five one as well, so yeah, yeah, so but as you say, you you remember these things because of that, you know, records are yeah. going to be broken or equaled or, or whatever. But there was something wonderful about that day, akin to the six two game, where you thought, yeah, you know, 
that this this team is is going places, or you felt that it was going places. Yeah, yeah. You touched on Scott Brown as well. I mean, this is he kind of symbolises almost where Celtic were to where Celtic suddenly are. If you like, if you put yourself in the in in, in, in that date, and it was quite mad because he looked like he was someone who had lost his way for the last couple of years. That maybe he needed a new, a fresh direction of travel as well, and it probably could have been elsewhere. I think a lot of us would have not been surprised. The only thing that would have saddened you was it would have probably unlikely have been to a, one of the top Premier English Premier League clubs that he'd been linked with in the past, like your Spurs, your Newcastles, mm-hmm. things like this. It would have been lower-end Premier League at that point, if not Championship, if, if you can take your mind back to how yeah. bad it had got. I, mean, I think a lot of people were even sort of question whether he should call it quits. He was only 31, but injuries had took their toll, <laughs> couldn't get fit. Boy, oh boy, was he fit that day. And uh, the one thing with Scott Brown, don't wind up someone who likes <laughs> being wound up. He <laughs> he plays on, like, that is what he wants you to do. He He's thrived like on that, didn't he, yeah. I, I think in general, you, you you can see with certain characters in, in all various sports as well, talking about football, be, you know with certain ones, how to push their buttons differently. The one thing you don't do is try and have thinly veiled attacks against someone who revels in that, gets motivated by it, and that is what we've seen. And of course, Scott Brown had said nothing in the lead up to it, other than agreed with Joey Barton at one point. That was the only time he referenced it where he said, oh, he's telling the truth. I'm, I'm not in his league. I've never been in his league. He's now in my league. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant because he said he's not even in my league. I'll toy with him and all this stuff. <laughs> well, factually, you're right. We've never played in the same league. Um, but then at the end, that's when, you know, again, and that was quite funny, wasn't it? Because the post-match interviews are almost as sort of famed as the, the, the sort of performance of the, yeah. the, the individual goals themselves. Because Brendan, as you say, in a, in a moment of joy, decides just to set a wee candid reminder to... The journalist that he's not going to be pushed about, and he ain't your mate either, by the way. So a thing which is fair enough, because you've got to kind of set your stall out as a manager sometimes as well. And doing it from a position of a five-one win probably catches anyone off yeah, <laughs> quite yeah. off guard. You're like, what? I thought that was going to be that was going to go down <laughs> the tree. Um, and then of course the Scott Brown one, where he says like, you know, it was easy, it was comfortable. I kept my mouth shut before it. Is he okay? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, he said he, this will come up later, but he said, "Did you know it was basically men against boys today?" Hey. I think he took an inhale of breath. I says it was basically men against boys. I'm positive he did. I would need to check that back, but I think he I, did. I'll go with your your yeah, knowledge on that. But yeah, we'll go with that. And also, speaking of Scott Brown, that mm-hmm. was the infamous conversation he had with Brendan Rodgers who went to his house and they were moving the condiments about well and the salt and pepper things and that's when he especially on <laughs> playing and he told them he would put longevity on his career if he looked after his body and he ate the right things and did the right things. A bit like the similar conversation he's clearly had with Callum McGregor before coming back a second time, what he envisages for him and the team and that kind of stuff. So History is kind of repeating itself with Brendan being there, but he certainly made Scott Brown focus again, didn't he? When, as you say, a lot of people were writing him off as a spent force, and he became the beating heart of that Celtic team, and he left Celtic with the moniker captain, leader, legend. I think Brendan Rodgers was largely responsible for uh, giving Scott Brown his love back for football. Definitely. And, uh, and, uh, yeah... And he owes a lot to Brendan Rodgers for that. And it was nice for Rodgers. He was asked today about Scott Brown. Does he keep tabs on Scott Brown as Fleetwood manager? And he said he keeps tabs on all these ex-players who have gone into management. And he speaks to them regularly. He was talking about he speaks. He spoke to Barry Robson during the summer as well. Yes. And I, I, and I love that. I really like that. And I know it's part of Brendan's stick that he's just a nice man. But... You know, I I like that about him that he does take his time to give his advice to these guys who have played under him, and I don't think they would be. I think if you've got Brendan Rodgers on tap on a back phone, you would you would use that 
wouldn't you, as a source of <laughs> education? So. And you know, yeah, you you'd like to think <laughs> so. So yeah, but yeah, a, a brilliant, another brilliant memory, Russell, and yeah, a, a brilliant moment where everything fell into place again for Celtic, didn't it? It was just that the fans were in great voice that day as well, and it was just a wonderful result. It certainly was, mate. It certainly was. I, uh, I just think that game was mad because it, you know, you you know, we always say almost the preseason cup that our rivals win and things like this, mm. and I think that was the inaugural preseason cup uh, tournament that we that we'd witness where they really did lay it on thick. Uh, you know the the if sort of remember, conjecture. Yeah, go on. If, if you remember, Mark Warburton was the manager of Rangers back then, and I think they played. Was it Hamilton Ackies in the first game of the season? And Joey Barton got megged. I, I could be wrong. And I think they drew one each. But Mark Wal- I remember Mark Warburton giving an interview and saying, we came out the tunnel that day and uh, he said, and we saw and we looked across to the... So if they came out, it would be the govern stand, wouldn't it? And they had the going for 55 type banner. And he said he was like, oof, you know... Don't know about that. We're, we're we're up against it here, you know. With Celtic bringing in Brendan Rodgers and you know bringing in guys like mm. uh, Sinclair and and, and Dembele and stuff like that. Uh, so I think he had knowledge of Dembele from his time down down south. So he was. I remember him saying, in hindsight, he was sort of saying it, it didn't really sit well with him because that was just like heaped pressure on Rangers straight away and and him like you're, you're up, you automatically win the title. Type mm. thing, you know, and he, he, he remember. I remember him talking about that and and feeling. You know, Is feeling there a vibe though that that's that's after the event sort of stuff and possibly, and yeah, Russell, I, possibly, but, but, I, because well, possibly, I, but I don't think he would ever admit it then, would he? Because you're the no. manager and you are going for fifty five. But mm, that's I, true. I guess, against hindsight, is a great thing. Everybody has twenty twenty, but I think he was being candid and honest and. You know that that probably what his gut was saying as he walked out the tunnel that day against Hamilton. But you would never ever profess that publicly, no. would you? At, during during that time, so I guess there is maybe a maybe a rewrite of history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tifo must have been set up way in advance, so someone must have told it. I think at times you get caught up in it all, and I dare yeah. say, uh, you know. Stronger men than Matt Warburton have been caught up at all. I think that that can just happen, and you're in a wave of optimism. And it's, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think he's he definitely protected it. And with hindsight, he's looking at it factually now, and he's probably just talking in the layman's yeah. terms that the, 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 you know, in a matter of fact sort of manner. But I don't know. It was brilliant, though, anyway. As I say, it was the, uh, it was the first time, the first time the preseason cup, um, had been won by Rangers, and I, uh, yeah, I think we emphatically showed that in the uh, the light and the sort of uh, worth, the true value that it brings. <laughs> Which is nothing. <laughs> yeah. Number three. We're at number three, aren't we, Russell, in the countdown, yes? Yes, yes. We need to go back to talking Ooh. about men against boys. Ah, okay. This will always in. be there for me, right? Um, yes. The Seville run... Yeah. And we are, this is only the second round, I believe, of the UEFA Cup. If I'm like right, them. the first leg was on Halloween, and it was against Graham Sunes's Blackburn side. Um, and we were not fancied by the English media to do all that much in the tie. Blackburn had tooled up big style. Uh, York and Cole up front, both of them at this point in time, only 31 years old. You know, they were like sort of still in kind of prime, sort of same age as Henrik, basically, the two of them. So, you know, the, these weren't uh, they weren't duds by now or anything like this. And uh, they had loads of other good players, like Two Guy. I know he played for Rangers and stuff, but he was a good player. Uh, David Thompson, I don't know if you remember him at that point. He was yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in goals, they had the goalkeeper of the moment in terms of the EPL and Brad Friedel. And he yeah. was getting rave reviews. Anyway, we play them, and it's 1-0 on the first leg. Celtic didn't play particularly well, but Henrik pops up with a goal. Whoa, and behold, what un- what then follows? Now, there's a wee bit of interesting thing about the men against boys, Tony. Mm-hmm. Who said it? I want to pick your brains. I thought it was Gary Flickcroft that said it. Correct! 
But the popular opinion now, and it's been rewritten, and I kind of like it being rewritten, right? But people just assume it was Sunes who said it. And it, it seems to be like this old bit yeah. and it was Gary Flitcroft, you're absolutely right. But the, the sort of legend now, if you hear it being passed on, it tends to yeah. be Sunes said it was men against boys. I don't think he did. But what it annoyed, not just me, but a Mr. Larson was for the next two weeks, wasn't just the men against boys thing. We watched the English media then start to sneer as Blackburn had passed Celtic off the park and it will be a matter of how many he would park if they could put in that display again. Celtic were lucky to get 1-0. And of course, the big question, is Henrik Larson really world class? Which became <laughs> a talking point in England after that, that game. So the, the, the first competitive game, Henrik would have played against English opposition unless he played under Vim against Liverpool, but he wasn't the goal-scoring phenomenon he was there anyway. And suddenly, there was a bit of a torch getting shone on Henrik and would he cut it, you know, on a, a rainy, wet night against Stoke or Sunderland or whatever nonsense it would be. What obviously transpires is that he would park, from a Celtic point of view, a landmark win, away from home against a really decent side. And with, again, like we were saying earlier, with it, you know, the 3-0 was emphatic. Well, this 2-0 was with distinction. No two ways about it. It was a slick professional display and one that showed Henrik at his best. I was just touching on Brad Friedel a minute ago. Two guys slip, not two guy. Uh, oh, sorry, Mike nearly came in. Uh, not two guy, uh, but John Hartson slips and I think... Oh, what is his name? Craig Short at the back for Blackburn. He slips as well. Henrik goes in outside of the boot, nonchalant, dinks it over the in vogue Brad Friedel. It cannot be beaten. Brad Friedel, I think he'd got man of the match at Highbury three days before or four days before. And Henrik's now, he's now warming up. He's already got his post match interview mm -hmm. planned out. Of course, to add a wee bit of more sort of um, spice to it. Chris Sutton, where he won a Premier League title before, um, and he won a, a golden boot in the English Premier League, a fact people forget as well. Joint, but he still won it. Uh, he then goes back to Ewood Park and scores, scores the second goal. So it was a brilliant display. And again, for me, the best thing, and I'll not, I'll not say it, we've, we've had problems with this before doing direct quotes live on podcast. <laughs> Uh, and it was Henrik's obviously now ready to sort of face up to the criticism that he's unfairly had over the last two weeks. Bearing in mind he scored the winner in the first leg and he scored the opener tonight away from home. And Ray Stubbs is interviewing, he says, well, Henrik, you know, who's seen that coming or something like that? And, you know, Henrik straight away says, in the first leg we played SHIT. And he says, but tonight we showed what we could do. He said... Uh, and you should always learn your lesson, never speak until the job is done. But he doesn't make eye contact with the reporter. He's kind of sworn on BBC. And you're like, oh. And that <laughs> gave you a wee bit of insight into the mindset of the competitor, Henrik Larson. Not just this brilliant, loyal professional that we had. He was a genius in the park. But that's still. And I like the fact that he did that after. And I think there was a, a bit of that that set the tone for that run. He was cold and calculating. He was a killer in front of goal and also as you say don't annoy him because he'll take it out and you yeah. the only way he knows how and that's to be cold and calculating and precision in front of goal I'll tell you I was at both of those games Russell I was at I covered the first Fantastic. leg uh, for the record which was brilliant because obviously Celtic won late with Larson's goal second leg I had one ticket and the partner I was with at the time had a car and uh so she drove us down and I got outside Ewood Park and I said to her, here's the bad news. I've only got one ticket. You take it. And she's like, I'm not going to myself. And as luck would have it, I saw some guys from East School Bride and said, look, can you take my, my then uh, partner at the time into the ground, look after her? And they said, yeah, no problem. What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to get a ticket off this guy who's standing here, who's clearly a tout and is charging over the odds. But, Two minutes before kickoff, he'll be begging me to take it. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> he, I love it. he wanted like 150 quid or something. And I told him by the end up, I think I got it for like 
about 50 or 60 quid because I just gave him everything that I had in my pocket. I said, look, yep. you'd, rather, you'd rather sell it for than the not make any money on it, you know? So, mm. uh, and that's exactly what happened. So, and Henrik Larsson's goal was the first away goal I'd ever seen a Celtic team score in Europe. Oh, yeah. And I'd been oh, to yeah. Paris, I'd been to Germany twice. Uh, try to think where else Celtic had drawn a blank, and I was thinking, I'm jinxed. I can't, I, it's, it's me, I can't, I I can't go and watch Celtic away mm-hmm. from home because they never score. So there was a euphoria there, and I, I was delighted for both of them because there was that criticism surrounding Henrik Larson. You think to yourself, why would anybody who watches football just open your eyes and watch this guy play? And it was just, it was. Real impudence and cheek, what he did to Brad Friedel. I mean, he took the mic out him, didn't he? Basically, with that wee oh, dink. It's so just, nonchalant. That outside it's of the boots, see when you watch it. It's a five or side goal, Russell, you know. Oh, see you behind the goal. Draw the goalkeeper to the edge of the, the five or side D, you just go dink. I yeah. love that. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. I also think, as well, there's a wee angle, there's a camera behind the net. And when you look at the spin on it, it's just sumptuous. Yeah. You know that way? It's, yeah. like, oh, oh, it's just a thing of beauty. And, um, and the great thing about it is Hartson just knocks into an area because he knows Henrik Larson will be there. And I know Craig Short slipped, but he just helps it on because he thinks yeah. even if it's a sprint or a, a kind of a, you know a duel for the ball, he's, he's still got the confidence mm-hmm. that Larson will get there. Not only get there and win the ball, he'll put it in the net. You know, and, yeah. and then obviously Sutton's headers just, you know, there was nobody... Yeah, stop him Sutton from burying that header into the net. Those near a... post headers as well. Is that not a trademark of his? Yeah. Wow. There was, a guy, there was a guy in the goal line who still couldn't keep it out because it's going like a bullet towards the net. Mm. And, you know, and he, he enjoyed that moment. I, I'm all for that. See this? that's crept into football where you don't celebrate scoring against your old club. Not having that Sutton <laughs> oh, win. Oh, that night. Uh, you represent the club that you play for. Uh, you know, uh, you have affection for every club that you represent, but when you're representing a particular club, if you score against your old club, that's what, that's what football's about, isn't it? That's, a, yeah. that's the meaning of football. So, I, I you know, I draw, I draw the line. <laughs> he was it that sprinted the whole... I had to buy off. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. there are celebrations and celebrations, but <laughs> even then, even then, I kind of quite admire these... Uh, you know, he's cheeking the actual bravery of doing that. And you just Funny. think, wow, that's some lens to go to, to to really give it tight to opposition. <laughs> but, you know, I, I hate this. Oh, sorry. It's almost apologetic. And I know Henrik never did it against, okay. uh, didn't do it uh, when he scored for Barcelona against Celtic. You can admire professionalism. Blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> I would have preferred it if he did celebrate. Because he was yeah. playing for Barcelona, and and the thing is about it, it was such a Henrik Larson like goal, wasn't it? That he scored oh, against Celtic, just anticipating oh, Alan Thompson being shot and dinking it over the goalkeeper. And I would have preferred it if he did celebrate it, because he wasn't playing for Celtic anymore. So, mm. and you, you'd had to. But it depends what way you fall on that. But I'm of the, I'm very much in the. The old school where you go tonto, even if you score against you your former club. Tonto. <laughs> <Enjoy it. laughs> you like score that. against your former club. You know, maybe it's just me, but hey. Uh, but yeah, but no, that that night in Blackburn was pretty special. He, he, I'm not saying you started to dream, but you were like, well, we've claimed a good scalp there. Who who do we First get? First time in my life I'd seen us have a convincing win in Europe. You know, yeah, that I could remember. I, I couldn't remember anything any time before that. A result that uh, influenced the outcomes because it got us through uh, to the next round as well, not just being a great performance and getting pats on the back for two points in the Champions League and things like that. Tony, it was a it was a performance that dictated outcomes and got us into the third round. Yeah. And then also not just that, because it was away from home, because the, the actual side you were playing were, well, you knew deep down they were a good side, right? That's the reality. Once you start looking at how comfortable we were in that game. I don't think we're thinking final time here, but suddenly there was a wave, I think, of confidence at that point. Now, hey, we're not a bad team either, by the way, when you when you put us up against decent opposition. Well, you look at the, like, I think Agat ran right that night, didn't he? He was excellent. I think Soonest mentioned him at 1.2, didn't he? He either mentioned him in the home leg or the away leg, but he, he made special 
reference to a gap. And you look at it and you think, and your mind sometimes plays tricks on you, but my goodness, what, what a player I got was. What a what a burst of speed he had. And, you know, I, I, he was a, I mean, he was a striker, originally, wasn't he? He was converted into kind of wing back by Martin O'Neill, wasn't he? He was, which is one one of the major tactical tweaks that uh, O'Neill did on an individual. What he also did, he would part that night for the first time. If you remember, I think, I think I'm right here. I better be right. Uh, I'm sure Paul Lambert was sacrificed. And it was the first time we've seen Hartson, Larson, Sutton all start together mm. as a sort of front three. And that in itself is such an aggressive mood when it's us protecting a lead away from home. And O'Neill's went for the reverse psychology. We'll start all three. I don't remember the, all three of them starting. Not as a front three, if you know what I mean, Troy. I know yeah. uh, Sutton would have sat a wee bit deeper. But normally if you'd seen all three in the same team sheet, it's because Sutton's playing centre-half. Do you know what I mean? Or, or centre midfield. Yeah. Whereas this was a, all the three big guns on from the get-go. How do you like them apples? And it was it was a, it was a statement of intent, you know? Oh, without a doubt, that was a, we're coming to win. We're not coming to defend what we've got. You thought we were lucky in the first leg. We'll show you we're a good side. And uh, we can mix Spot it with on, you. Mate. And they did. And they mixed it with them big time. And I think kind of, I think Gary Flickroft was certainly made to eat his words. And I think soon as had nothing much to say about it, beating fair, fairly and squarely. Uh, yeah, you can argue the toss about the first leg. I thought Blackburn did play well in the first leg. So I think maybe fortunate to sneak it at the end, but they kept going, didn't they? Larson did what he does best, presented with a chance and they buried it. So, But yeah, that 3-0 aggregate win, certainly uh, the second leg was another emphatic performance. And as you say, especially away from home and considering the opponents and the outcomes of, of what happened yet. On board with that, Russell, excellent. Another excellent moment. Yes. Can you wait now to your last two? So number two, yeah. what what's in the silver medal position, Russell? So the silver medal position is, it's a wee bit of a story behind it, which is good. Uh, yeah. 2004, Scottish Cup final, Henrik's last game. Oh, his last game, yeah. So, two weeks before that, genuinely, I cried like a baby when he left. I was 17 years old. It's the only time I've ever cried like that over football or anything. Even if we get beat, I feel sick, maybe. I've never cried like that. I, he broke my heart when he started bubbling in, the, in his last game at Celtic Park. I, I mean, where, I think he scored two against Dundee United, and then he yeah. couldn't control it. And I was like, oh, I'm going up to my room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just couldn't believe how emotional I'd felt at that point. And you you, you were absolutely right. Uh, he's What did you say? He was cool and what else? Calculating. Calculated, mate. That all came that all came back in his veins by the time Hamden came around. His swan song. Again, it's all about dictating outcomes, Tony. If we're 1-0 down to Dunfermline... Um, Rick, I'll get you out. Don't you worry. <laughs> is it is it too good a storyline to be true? Doesn't matter either way. I'm doing it. And uh, I mean, the first goal is utterly sublime. That colour into the far corner. Yeah, I don't know. He, he just makes it look so easy. He almost does a wee sort of gallus. Remember these wee sort of runs yeah, celebrations? Yeah, yeah, he scored yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. He's having a bit of fun there. I wonder what odds he was to get the next goal after he scored the first. I reckon it would be 1-100. Because you could feel it then. He's definitely... Yeah. 100% going to score the next goal. You could tell. Wasn't the irony about that goal, Big Bobo had punched the ball away, didn't he? In, <laughs> in, 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 in the move that led to Henry last yeah. equalising, and he, and he somehow got away with it. Mm. And then when you see it back, it's as clear as day. Honest and, mistake, and, Tony. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, had VAR been there, either would have been a chance to go 2-0 down because he's done fell with others. A certain penalty, Big Bob was just went like that. I mean, he's punched yeah. the ball, or, you know, one of them, mm. and the ball's broke. And before but anybody, then when can, Sutton's, Sutton's through ball. Aye, before anybody can say anything or say, wait a minute, there, what happened? Ball's in the back of the net because your man's just took control of the situation. Mm. I think he was, was he going with Labont? I think, or might have been. Skeller. Labont or Skeller, one of the two of them, I, and uh, he, one of, he's yep. fell, hasn't he? And the next thing you you know, 
when he's coming in at that angle. Doesn't matter. You're not saving it because he's he's cold and he's calculating and he's a killer in those situations and he proved it he so many killer. times. And as you say, he had his swan song against Dundee United. He got the he got the emotion out of his system. I think out of his system. Yeah, like yeah. He, that's exactly what he did. And then he realised. I've got a job to do here, and my trophy. my my final game for the club can't let that dictate, you know. And and also, he he signposted that he was leaving, so everybody was prepared for the fact that he was leaving. They weren't prepared for the fact that he was going to break down on the pitch. That's so and, true. And and uh, and grown men and women, to a man, woman, and child, were, were weeping along with him because it was it was the end of an era, right? Now, people, I speak highly as well. When Kenny Douglas left Celtic, I think lots of people, it's akin to that because you you were watching a world-class player, weren't you? Kenny Douglas is a world-class player, no doubt about it. He's the last world-class player that Scotland has ever produced. I'll argue with anybody on that. Yep. Henrik Larson is your generation world-class player who gave seven years and who you will not see his like again at the football club. 242 goals, 315 games. I know that off by heart. I described the whole, every one of them. Young Ryan this morning asked me, he scored the, who was his first goal against us? Like, Berry Rangers, Tyne Castle, Link Up Guys, 7-0, right? That kind of thing. Right? So, certain things just, right? So, yeah, but that kind of, as you say, that couple of weeks where I think Everybody was getting used to it. Even Henrik was getting used to the fact that he wouldn't be playing in the hoops anymore. But he gave us a year's day, notice, didn't he? Yeah. He gave us a year's notice. He, 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 he did tell everybody, I believe, at the end of this season. So, you know, get your How head around it. How refreshing is that as well? Get what a world class way to, to even well, yeah. sort of carry out your career, not just on the, on the part, but to do that and go, thanks for sticking by me when I was in a bad time, firstly by signing me. Secondly, throughout my leg break, and then thanks for rewarding me when I did well and give me record breaking contracts. I'll never catch on, Tony. But yeah. if you reward someone like that, you give him that sort of money, he says, I signed to 2004 and I'll stay till then. You think of what he's turned down in that time, but it was give a little, get a lot back, give a little more, get a heck of a lot back. And um, I, I just think. Uh, I just think from from Henrik to, to, to be a year's notice, it's almost like he doubted Celtic's ability to replace him in his win, not without saying it. And he's like, I'll give you a year to try and work out that conundrum, you know? <laughs> and again, I mean, you, you speak to people who are old enough to remember when Kenny Dalish left. How do you replace Kenny Dalish? You don't. But you move on and you 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 always discover new heroes. You don't sign on Rick Camaro on loan. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the thing, isn't it? You, you you discover new heroes. New heroes come along. Always, always, always. And, uh, you know, there, there's life after Kenny Gleeson. There was life after Henrik Larsson. And it doesn't feel like it, that it will be at that precise moment in time. And, yeah, I can understand your 17-year-old heart being broken by uh, Larsson. Oh, he was. He was and, 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 and I think there was two two things for me about last and the and I've I've mentioned this before as well. The the clip when he held up the silver medal after the FA Cup final and he's just he's crestfallen and he says, I didn't come here for this. Mm. And and he was superhuman that night against Porto and Seville. Yeah. And all, all he needed was three or four players to be like him. Yeah. He, he did his bit. And there was not a bit of me that night that sat and uh, or that stood in in the ground who didn't think he was anointed and he was going to get a hat trick and Celtic were going to win the year for cup. And uh, and it didn't happen. And I think he he felt as if he'd let the fans down as well by not getting a hat trick, but not being super Henrik and but my goodness, he he, he carried them. He, he carried them out the ordinary at times, didn't he, Henrik Larson? Even he that did. game against Dundee United, they're losing one 0 and he scores twice. It's like, this is the way it ends. This is the way it has to end. In the last league game at Celtic Park, he's home for seven years. Spiritual football home. Yep, there's going to be tears and snotters, but that's the way it has to end. And then you get your professional head, cold, calculating clinical head back on. Got another trophy to win. We're not losing to Dunfermline. 
it ain't yes. ending. It ain't ending like that. And uh, yeah, that whole kind of so, couple of weeks were surreal, mm -hmm. really, weren't they? Mm. So for me, it gets even more surreal. So I'm obviously I've had my two weeks of tantrums over Henrik leaving, misery, despair. I can't be coming to an end. Almost dreading a cup final. Do you know that? Because I knew it was his last game. I was consumed by the fact Henrik Larson was leaving at the time at seventy. I mean, consumed by it. And um, in fact, I was sixteen. I turned seventeen later that year. I was still sixteen. Give myself a wee bit more credit here now <laughs> because it was a bit embarrassing. But anyway. Morning of the, the cup final, the girlfriend phones. And she says, I can't believe this hasn't occurred to me, but it has now. She goes, I've got about 20 tickets for the cup final. For, like, my dad got them all. Do you want to come? And I'm like, what? She goes, the problem is you'll be in the Dunfermline end. But do you want to come and see her? And she was like, I know how much the, the last and stuff's meant. She says, we're all going. Yeah, I want to go. So I watched the game <laughs> in the Dunfermline end. And what I will always say about that experience was trying not to celebrate is the hardest thing in the world. <laughs> Mouthing along that you're singing along with the, the other fans is <laughs> <laughs> difficult. And thirdly, what a credit, or what a credit to Henrik, I suppose, is it in, and to those reports, so many of them stayed back to watch him off the trophy, you know, yeah. clapping. And it wasn't Celtic, to be fair, they were clapping. It was 100%. They wanted to see so many stayed. Do you know what I mean? Which made my powers of persuasion for us to get to stay a wee bit longer to watch the trophy lift a bit easier. So thank you, Henrik. I got to see that bit as well. But yeah, what a bizarre uh, turn of events to end up crying for two weeks and then actually being physically at Henrik's last uh, competitive fixture for Celtic, albeit in the wrong end. <laughs> I think I'm right in this, Russell, that I'm sure my, I was there with my mum and dad. I think my mother attended that game as well. And we're sitting there, and my mum says, oh, look at her. She looks a bit bonny. She's all done up. Like, I recognise her. <laughs> it's Penny Lancaster. She's sitting beside Rod Stewart <laughs> in the same row. You, you couldn't make it up. I think it was a little bit three or four away from us. <laughs> it's just like sitting beside Rod Stewart. But it's just the way my mum sort of looked up. I'm, that's why I remember it. And I was like, oh, I recognise oh, her. She's really good. Look, she, she's done up really nice and smartly turned in. <laughs> so I can't argue that. <laughs> no wonder. <laughs> like, very like who she's always. with. You know, and, and, and if, I think she went, oh, it's Rod. No one of the ones is mm. like, oh, it's Rod. You're like, yes, mother, it's Rod Stewart. He's a Celtic supporter, but yeah. But yeah, Quickly that... that well, yeah, on you go, I was sorry, going go. to say to you, just based on what you were saying there as well about, uh, about Seville, it's just a cut to me. I really thought about this. The probably easiest thing for Henry would have been to, in 2003, say, get some money for me as well. And look, we're not going to make the UEFA Cup final again. I'm not going to get that opportunity again to play in a European final with you guys. Also... At this moment in time, I'm only 31 years old. You'll get a good chunk of change from even with a year left. I think we would have got upwards of seven to ten million pounds from him at that point with only 12 months left in his deal. People will be scoffing right now. Hmm. I think that would be about right. Uh, but that would have been seven to ten million pounds more and uh, it would have allowed Henrik an extra year at said big club he would have went to. I think that would have been a conversation the club would have been open to having. And I think it would be one if Henrik had decided to leave a year earlier based on we got this close, but so far it's so funny that instead don't back down, double down comes to plan, <laughs> Tony. And he decides that he wants one more go at it because when he leaves, he wants to leave on the right note. Yes, gutted that we lost in the UEFA Cup quarterfinals that year because it did suddenly start looking like this could happen again. Um, but leaving when in, in dictating. Uh, the outcome of trophies again, I just thought it was fantastic. I think actually he might have left had Celtic won the UEFA Cup. Had they won it? Yeah, 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 I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm convinced he would have left then because he would uh, he would have achieved everything that he would have possibly wanted to achieve with Celtic. I'll go back to I didn't come here for this. And I think maybe going through his head was I can't leave like that. I don't want to leave it like that. I don't want to leave this club that's meant so much to me. I could be wrong in that. I've never actually heard them say it, but it's something I'd love to ask them if I ever get the uh, the chance to say, would you have left if Celtic had won the UEFA Cup? Because... Well, think about it. 
clearly a decision has been made. Hence why you've been given a year's notice. Yeah. So there has been a there has there's definitely been, been, a, been a conversation about it, eh? Yeah. I, even if it's only been in his own mind. Yeah. But I think you might be right because why would you give the years notice? That's like you've had to say to yourself, "Am I staying or am I going?" I, I, I and genuinely it's funny think... that in adversity, I, he's decided to stay, yeah. and in glory, he would have decided to leave. Job done. Wow. I, I, I genuinely think that he I cared too much that I don't think he could put the Celtic supporters through that. You know, the agony of losing that cup final, and then him saying, "By the way, I hate to break it to you like this, but I'm off." You know, I don't. I, mean, I could be reading that situation completely wrong. But I think you're this, right. This is a man who loved his tenure at the club and was asked if you could have your time again for which big club, who would it be, and why? And he said Celtic because that's where he made his name. And you think what he did? He won the Champions League with Barcelona. He went to Manchester United, played enough games to win a, a, a title, and revered everywhere. Thierry Henry said it himself, didn't he? Arsenal yeah. never lost to Barcelona. We lost to Henrik Larsson mm. in that in that Champions League final. And tells you, you know, Ronaldinho said it was a pleasure. Eto said it was an honour to play alongside them. Guys like that. So, and I think that's why everybody rejoiced that night when Barcelona beat Arsenal. Victory Every football, Celtic yeah. supporter rejoiced because they wanted it. They wanted him to get his hand on the cup with the big ears. The European trophy that eluded them at Celtic. They wanted mm. them to get that that uh, satisfactory ending to a career that deserved that. And I've spoke to this with Paul Lambert as well. And I think that Celtic team deserved to win the UEFA Cup final. They just had the misfortune of playing a team who were on an upward trajectory with a manager who was on an upward trajectory as well. And Paul Lambert says it's his biggest regret because he would have owned at that time two winners medals from the, the two major European competitions. And I think a player of Larson's calibre also deserved that to have at that time, it's now been obviously the Europa Conference League has come into being as well. But I think Henrik Larson deserved to be a proud owner of a yeah, winner's medal and, and a, a Champions League winner's medal. And, you know, there are certain people that deserve it. Football's not like that, but, you know, I, I think it would have been fitting for a man like that to be the proud owner of two golds rather than a silver and a gold, but hey, I well uh... he didn't, he didn't, and I got to, you know, he got to win a Scottish Cup instead a year later and let me celebrate <laughs> in silence. <laughs> he, he, he did indeed. So there you go. Right, then the yes. down drum roll, please. Your top moment, Boise, go on. Give us. Yes, a... I think you know the story. Uh, 97-98 season, stopping the 10. Uh, we had grown up in an era where Rangers won time after time, sadly, Tony, um, against us. They were they were obviously, they won nine in a row. They're going for this, the 10 in a row. It was an unfathomable thought. It, there was a lot of pressure that season. We thought we had the job done the week before, done Fairman, and then what was his surname? It's quite a long one. What was his surname? Falconbridge, Craig Falconbridge. Looping header. Two surnames in one. Uh, and Falkenbridge scored that looping header over, uh, is it Johnny Golden goals? Johnny Golden. Anyway, yeah. I remember where I was. I was watching that at a friend in Denny's house. I remember it. I was so young and feeling so sick. But anyway, we've got another another stab at it. And obviously, I've been brought up football in the living room guy, Tony. That's, that's how it was when it came to Celtic. We went rarely. I think the first season we went was that season. We went uh, once or twice. But it wasn't something that we were in a financial position we could afford all the time and all that stuff, yada, yada. It doesn't matter. Football was still part of our DNA, the same as anyone else's, but it just came to me, watched it from our armchair. Um, or dad, in dad's case, standing leaning on the mantelpiece like that and uh, quite intense at times, to be honest with you, watching the game. He stressed me out more than the football, to be honest, at the times, right? And uh, I can't remember specifically the game, what derby it was, but Rangers have scored against us, put it that way. Trying to join the dots of which one when I was only nine years old, ten years old, Tony, is a bit of a stretch, so I don't want to make it up as I go along. But one of the games during that season, undoubtedly, 
We have a semi detached house. My best pal lived in the other side of it. School pal, same class, same age. They're one side, we are the other. They're blue, we're green, stuff like this. So, but we all got on great. Like, he was my best pal, like the, the uh, Mark. But whatever's occurred, and I can't remember the exact scenario, our wall, which obviously connects to their house and it's two living rooms against each other, has started banging as Rangers have scored mm-hmm. a goal. And Dad is standing looking at me going, what do you think would happen? <laughs> I'm like, mm-hmm. what do you mean? And he went, what do you think would happen? I was like, oh, calm, like, calm down. He goes, no, I'm just, he goes, it's noted. I'm like that. In my mind, I don't know what he's talking mm-hmm. about. I'm like, is he being fisticuffs or whatever? Like, no one needs that in their life. Anyway, it turns out he had just stuck it in his back pocket, a mental note, as they say, Mr. Haggerty. So, <laughs> having fallen at the first hurdle uh, against Dunfermline, all the pressure goes to paradise. Final day of the season. Got to beat St. Johnston. How much can we talk about Henrik Larson in one show? But he scores an exquisite goal uh, to set, you know, to settle the nerves. Essentially, kind of settle the nerves. I think it actually got nervier, if my memory serves me right. It got worse, yeah. It got worse, aye. And if you obviously you remember, I only had the Ben for the radio. Couldn't mm. watch it. He couldn't just stream it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm stuck. What's the and the thing is when you listen to something on the radio, Tony. It could go out for a shy at the halfway line, and you think it's nearly a goal. Mm-hmm. It's like the, the way the comment, the commentary yeah, yeah. sometimes can sort of sound more exciting than it needs to. Anyway, Harold Bratback seals the deal, and we are bouncing about. Amazing moment, like in the family and stuff. Just I had been very much like dad didn't just let you watch football. My dad was someone who talks you through reasons <laughs> behind every single aspect of. Well, this is why you support Celtic. This is why they're bad. This is what 10 in a row means if they get it. Do you know what I mean? Yada, yada, yada. So I'm kind of grasping it. I wasn't stupid as a kid. I was kind of, all right, okay, big deal. I've got this. <laughs> and the fact we did it, it was an amazing, amazing feeling. But then it escalates in absolute chaos, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> as now a uh, sports scene can now show, obviously, live coverage because the game's finished. So you're watching, it was a... Uh, Tom Boyd and all that in the white t-shirts. Well, that smell the glove. Smell the glove, yep. Mm-hmm. This is all going on. We wait. We watch the trophy get lifted. Tom Boyd one-handed. Amazing scenes. And I turn around and Dad's now suddenly got no top on. And he's like, as hairy as Austin Powers. He's not like me. Do you know what I mean? I still kind of grow a beard. I'm about 35. And he's, he's now got no top and looking quite animated. And I'm like, what are you doing? He goes into the fridge, magnum bottle of champagne, Tony, straight out the front door, into the front <laughs> gardens, as I've told you already, semi-detached house. There's no wall between the gardens. He has uncorked his champagne and is pouring it all over his head, spraying it at the window at the wall. <laughs> at first, I kind of was like, what are you doing? I felt almost embarrassed. And then I just started rolling about. I thought there was just a bit of started joining the dots. I went, he's got a long memory of him. That yeah. comes back to, and yeah, I suppose yeah. you look at it more reflective as, as time goes on, he's no longer with us and stuff, but that would be definitely, that's the number one memory. I'll never forget that as a classic. And that's brilliant, Russell. That's, uh, you see, it. there's nothing better than sharing a memory with a family member, isn't it? And as you've said there, and, and as I know, your, your father's no longer with us, but uh, of all, that was the the mother of all title wins, but it featured yeah. your fat featured your father, which is just yeah. the, the best uh, the best thing it. ever, isn't it? And it was the mother of all title wins, and uh, that team. Uh, Paul Lambert also says that there's not enough made about that at Celtic Park. You know, not enough. You know, kind of homage to Vim Jansen in particular, and uh, I I would be behind something like that some kind of monument or some kind of uh, to, to Vim Janssen because he preserved history, you know, and your father drummed it into you as a young kid growing up, what it meant. And it's only through family members doing that that you do get that fervour and passion for Celtic in you. You, you, very quickly, uh, you very quickly grasp it, you grasp it, and 
And it was Billy McNeil that said it after the centenary season, didn't it? There's a fairy tale element about this football club. Those fairy tales and tales of folklore are passed down from generation to generation. And uh, you you are a Celtic supporter, mostly largely because of a family member, aren't you? In my case, my dad, That's your case, your father, and my grandfathers and grandparents, people passing it down. But once it's there, it ain't going anywhere. It ain't no. leaving you. And that's why these you have you go through the roller decks in your mind, don't you? Games, players, but these moments in particular stand out. And they stand out for a reason, because there was something monumental about that historic achievement of shattering the ten, preserving mm. Jock Steen's legacy, Lisbon Lions' legacy, all that kind of stuff, uh, or that kind of era of football team. And Jock Steam is my father. Story as well. uh, Jock, yeah, Jock Steam is my father's hero. Yeah, well, considering yeah. they lost the first two games of that season, again, Henrik Larson having a, a debut to forget the Easter Road. For people. And the quality that that Rangers team had, though, as well. I mean, it felt like they'd maybe just went one season too many with some yeah, of the same, I mean, some I mean, of the same players, but you could see why there was faith in them. They, yeah, had, well, they had a lot of credit in the bank for the, the trophies they'd won. And our team was a, it was, felt it. If I remember correct, and again, I was very young, but also I didn't have much else going on in my life at nine years old, Tony. I didn't have the distractions you get <laughs> as you, you become in your teens, you know? I, I, and you kind of are reading every single article in a newspaper, front to back. You're, you know, you're buying the, the football magazines and stuff like that in the summer. I just, I'm sure it felt like we were kind of cobbled together and it was, <laughs> let's hope. But... It was a, yeah, it was a ragtag and bobtail kind of cobbling together, but I think the way Vim Janssen and Murdo McLeod got that team and made them a team clever and gelled them was absolutely brilliant. And you can't, mm-hmm. I mean, Vim Janssen was absolutely sensational. One year, did what he had to do. But I think also not enough credit's given to Murdo McLeod in that mm-hmm. too. Murdo was an out and out Celtic man who yep. clearly told Vim Janssen what this meant. And having spoken to a few members of that team, they said Vim Janssen was the calm one. You know, don't know if it was good cop, bad cop, because Murder's a brilliant guy. So mm-hmm. good cop, good cop. But you needed that Celtic presence to say to Vim Janssen, look, this isn't he good enough after the first two games, but Vim just being as laid back as they come, never did much press either, eh, Vim Janssen. But Paul Amert always says that he was as calm as anything. You know, you've lost 2-1 to Hibs at Easter Road. Opening game of the season, you've lost two one to Don Fellman in the following game at Celtic Park. And it's just like you're behind the eight ball and Vim's like Tranquilo, trust me, this'll this'll work out. Or mm. or if he wasn't uh, panicking, he he certainly had it. And then that team came together, the League Cup final, when they blew Dundee United away, Oasis roll with it at Ibrooks, all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. Roll and with and that, af- of course. After that momentum. And then you look at that team, you had Mark Reaper in defence, you had Paul Lambert in midfield, you had Henrik Larson up front, you had uh, Craig Burley in the midfield. You know, you so you had a calibre of player there who could go toe to toe with Rangers. Yeah. And then the New Year game where Burley and Lambert scored was the one where you felt, we can do this, you know, because I think they went a point to within a point of Rangers at the top, could have gone seven behind. Uh, mm. I think Rangers were four in front, could have gone seven behind had they lost it, went a point behind them and, and never really looked back after that. It was That was a statement victory of that season where everybody felt the Rangers are there for the taking. That was That's a Rangers true. team, that, a Rangers team that, as you say, maybe a season too far was maybe on a decline on, on the wane, but you're forgetting that it's... The, apart from the Rangers team of the early 60s, with Jim Baxter and, and Brandon, people like that. That's arguably the greatest ever Rangers team in living memory that Celtic were up against, that Tommy Burns couldn't topple. And then Vim Janssen had the onerous task of toppling it when it really, really mattered. When yeah. the pressure I was at, that circle. when the pressure was at its height, you know, it doesn't get any more pressure than that, does it? Yeah. When Vim Janssen and Murder McLeod look at that dressing room and say at the start of the season, guys, you know what's at stake. I don't need to tell you. Yep. And then, as you say, these folklore and fairy tales, Harold Brack back gets slaughtered for missing the target many times. 
Mm. Did he miss a did he miss a target when it mattered? You That's know, true. Your talisman. You see, settle the nerves, made it ten times worse. Which is weird, wasn't it? Because it was excruciating that second half. I think if you look at the highlights, which obviously I'm sure you've, you just naturally end up on these things on YouTube and you go down one of your rabbit holes, as it were, and you, you look at the crowd in the in the stadium, Tony, as it pans around, the nerves almost, almost can you can feel it off the screen. Even now you can feel it. You go, oh, it takes you right back. I think it's weird to try and compare it to the the most recent one because of the no fans. That is not the reason completely why we didn't win that league. That's not what I'm trying to say. But you can never really grasp the nerves that come with it because there's no optics for you to go even reflect on now of supporters in said situations. All you had was podcasts talking about it online. But see, in the moment, those stands full, the nervous tension in there, you, you didn't get any of that. And in nah. a season, I talked about dictating outcomes earlier, Tony. That was a season that was dictating the, as you say, you know, the, the biggest sort of event that would happen in Scottish football domestically. And that would have been 10 titles in a row. See, when there's not a fan there to, to even, so you can see the relief from the Rangers side. And maybe that would have highlighted how big a deal it was from ours in 97, 98 as well, because you would see it from the from the opposite uh the opposite side of the fence. However, without that there, I think that, for me, it'll, it'll always sort of taint the sort of magnitude of it because when you look back, it just, it just the whole thing just looks weird and doesn't feel like the end to a football season, albeit the, the, the season ended very early that year for us. Yeah, but I think Celtic supporters get their head around the fact that they weren't going to win the 10. Yeah. And it was a, and it was a slow, painful process. Yeah. That limped, limped on to that day at Tannadice when it was finally confirmed that Rangers had uh, shattered 10 in a row just to Celtic had done. But there was a kind of, there was a surreal element to it all, wasn't it? Uh, 100%. Uh, it, it, it was football, Jim, but not as we know it, wasn't it? <laughs> if you but seriously, and that's not to take anything away from what Rangers did because they won that title. But it's almost as if it's been kind of airbrushed, not so mm. much by Celtic supporters, but just airbrushed from history in general. Because the whole yep. year, the whole year was a write-off football seasons and everything. I mean, I don't think, I don't think, I think in a few years' time, if somebody asks you who won the title in twenty twenty one, the COVID season, you, you, you'd struggle to remember. <laughs> you'd be like, well, mm. you would know because it kind of. It hurt you, but it, I think that it you won't be. What I would say is your 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 box of memories won't come out to play and haunt you as much because you won't have shattering images of their stands rocking as they scored yeah. goals. You won't have all those memories coming back when you associate it with it. And I, and I think it was a a small consolation to Celtic fans that they didn't see that. Yeah. You know, then they got their head around the fact that this weird season. You know, when it when it wasn't meant to end like that, it come to a kind of shuddering halt very early on in the campaign when you went yeah. Yeah. so many points behind, and then there was the Dubai debacle and all that, and you just and you just sort of said to yourself, "Listen, let's limp on, let's get this out the road. The inevitable is going to happen." And I think Celtic supporters had a lot of time to prepare for that. It was how they were going to bounce back from that, which was more important to them, wasn't it? get back on the winning saddle, which they have done, which they did do under Ange Postacoglu. Sceptical at first, but hey, it happened. And now hoping that the second coming of Brendan Rodgers can continue in that vein. Absolutely. And uh, we await the outcome of that. But Russell, that's been absolutely magic. That's been nearly an hour of gold. Oh, you can't beat stuff like that. Uh, as I said at the top of the programme, you can catch Russell on the Boise bus. Yes, indeed, that's where <laughs> we can find you these days talking and waxing lyrical about Celtic mm. with a, a whole plethora of guests. But you all know me. This has been the Celtic Way sit down. This has been the five moments that made me with Russell Boyce. And if you've enjoyed this, then we always ask you, help us, help us help you by providing top quality content and support the Celtic Way website. And 
top quality football journalism covering the club you love and hit that subscribe button mm -hmm. www.celticway.co.uk forward slash subscribe all that left for me to say is russell boyce thank you so much for joining me on top, man. five celtic moments that made me that was magic stella i think is the word for that <laughs> and and uh, I'll give you the last word, sir. Take it away. No, thanks very much, Tony. I think uh, you know we could probably hopefully do this again in ten years' time, and maybe there'll be some new memories to go in there as well. You just never know. I think it's exciting times as a Celtic fan. But no, congratulations on everything you've done with the channel as well. I know how much you've been pushing it. You've been front, left, and centre, and you've always been very good to me. Tony through the good and the dark times. You've always been good to me, mate. So I appreciate it, pal. I know I can be a pest. So thank you. <laughs> I will. Thanks very much for that. That's very kind. Guys, take care. We'll see you soon enough on the Celtic Way sit down. Thanks for tuning in.